in this clip, we're going to describe the pathobiology of acute appendicitis and relate that to the clinical symptoms. Initially, in acute appendicitis, the patients complain of mid-abdominal pain. And the pain is noted to be colicky, or it has a waxing and waning course. Pathologically, what's usually happening in that case is that there's some pain associated with the appendix, which is a viscous, or an internal organ. One thing that could happen, for example, is that there could be obstruction of the appendix by a fecalis. And at that point, the appendix might be contracting against the obstruction. What happens at that point is that there's pain receptors in the gut, and they are called visceral sensory afferents because they're the pain receptors associated with a viscous itself. Another possibility is if you don't want to invoke the fecalis, is you could just simply have ischemia of the pain, of the, of the appendix, or inflammation of the appendix for various reasons, such as obstruction with food, um, where the capillary perfusion pr pressure is insufficient, or for some reason, transudation of bacteria into the wall, and then you get inflammation of the appendix. And what you could think of that is, is these here are the appendix, the white is the mucosa, the purple line here is the muscularis mucosa, and then the brown or dark red is the muscularis propria. And whatever the inciting insult is, you can imagine the first thing happens is that your neutrophils, which I'm drawing in green, go into the appendiceal wall. At that point, your viscera, your viscera, your appendix is, is inflamed, and your visceral sensory afferents pick that up your nerves that innervate the wall of the appendix per se. But that innervation is what we call visceral innervation. And visceral innervation causes referred pain. And that refers in a vague way to the mid-abdomen. And visceral pain tends to be colicky, especially if it's a pain of obstruction and it has this waxing and waning course. And the patients often have mid-abdominal cramps. The next thing that happens is that the inflammatory process extends beyond the viscera and onto the serosa, which is the outer layer of the appendix that I'm showing here. I'm squaring it off now in red. When the pain goes into the outer layer, this is called a serositis, and it contacts the surface of the peritoneum, and that causes a localized peritonitis, inflammation of the peritoneum. And as you know, the peritoneum has a visceral peritoneum and a parietal peritoneum. And this is the visceral peritoneum, and that also contacts the parietal peritoneum. And the parietal peritoneum has what's called somatic innervation. So that peritonitis, that localized peritonitis, the extension of the acute inflammation into the outside of the organ and the serositis, changes the nature of the pain. And the pain goes from visceral pain, it transitions to somatic pain. And the mediators that are now picking it up are a type of mediator that's called somatic afferents. Somatic afferents. And what happens clinically to the patient? The pain migrates. Step two. The pain migrates from vague referred pain in the mid-abdomen to specific pain above the appendix in McBurney's point. And that's the famous migration of, to the right lower quadrant. And at that point, you get clinically what we call peritoneal signs. And all of you will be familiar with the peritoneal signs. That's your rebound, your guarding, your cough localization, your shake localization. These are peritoneal signs. But what it tells you is that you now have pain that's accessible, that your body is picking up through its somatic innervation, which means that there must be a serositis. So now we have a localized peritonitis with rebound and guarding and cough and shake tenderness and migration of the pain to the right lower quadrant. But in addition, these various soluble humoral mediators, inflammatory humoral mediators, including cytokines such as interleukins and, 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 and tumor tissue necrosis factor, as well as other humoral mediators, including complement elements, etc., etc., 
they move beyond the local vasculature and they go into your systemic circulation. So humoral mediators get to your systemic circulation. Even though the inflammatory process is localized, the mediators, the humoral mediators, the blood-soluble mediators go systemic. And what does that give you? A systemic inflammatory response. What are the the hallmarks of the systemic inflammatory response. Well, one of them is this cascade causes interleukin-6 to be expressed in the brain, and that gives fever. The inflammatory mediators go to the bone marrow and make increased white cells, and that's leukocytosis. So when you have a patient who has a pe features of right lower quadrant pain with rebound and guarding, but now the patient has fever and a white count, you could be sure the patient has a systemic inflammatory response. That could be dangerous because, well, one of the things it does is acute phase reactive proteins get re re released by the liver, but that's not what's dangerous. What's dangerous is, for example, that there are vascular consequences. There's diffuse body-wide arteriolar vasodilation that drops your blood pressure. Your body responds to that by increasing your heart rate, and that's when you get hypotension, decreased blood pressure, and tachycardia. So hypotension and tachycardia are part of the systemic inflammatory response, and they're more progressive than the fever and leukocytosis. So first you'll get the fever and leukocytosis, and then eventually, if nothing is treated, you could eventually get hypotension and tachycardia, and also these mediators cause diffuse capillary permeability, which causes edema. This constellation of edema, and especially hypotension and tachycardia, is part of the systemic inflammatory response that moves toward the response that we call the sepsis or the septic response. And that could, it, it could manifest other ways. It could damage your lung and cause a picture that we call shock lung, which I won't get into here. It could damage your kidneys. This is the pathological, uh, pathology of the septic cascade. The point that I want to make here is even somebody with a localized inflammation and a localized peritonitis can get a systemic inflammatory response that could ultimately be fatal. And the first window to see that the patient's getting a systemic response is fever and white count. So that shows you the clinical presentation of appendicitis. It starts off with mid-abdominal colicky pain. That's the pain of a viscous. It goes to localized right lower quadrant abdominal pain that's sharp and that has rebound and guarding. That's somatic pain. Then you get fever and a white count. That's a systemic inflammatory response. The last thing I want to mention to the student is just to emphasize the point that just because the inflammation is local, even localized inflammation, in other words, localized peritonitis, could still give a systemic inflammatory response. But sometimes you wonder, but could the inflammation sometimes get localized, uh, get generalized? And the answer is sort of yes. Imagine that the appendix ruptures and bursts. Then all this bacteria and stool and endotoxin from the lumen gets out diffusely into the peritoneal cavity. That's what we call a generalized peritonitis. These are the patients who look really sick and they're not moving at all. They have a bored, rigid abdomen. They have shallow breathing. They have a generalized peritonitis and they have basically rebound and guarding all over their quadrants. That's a very strong urgency. And those patients have a lot of endotoxin and they could be very, very septic and their septic will evolve quicker. And those patients, this is an absolute urgency. But the point is, is that appendicitis could give rise to both a localized peritonitis and a gen or a generalized, more rarely but more severely, a generalized peritonitis. But whether, even if the inflammation is just localized, it still could give rise to a systemic inflammatory response. And that's why when you call your staff in the middle of the night and say, I have a patient who has mid-abdominal pain that migrated to the right lower quadrant with rebound and guarding, your first question your staff will ask is, is there fever and a white count? And that's the end of this clip.